How's everyone doing? Is everyone as excited? So good evening. My name is Shelby Chestnut and I'm the co-director of community organizing and public advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. I'm also an alumni of the New School's Public Engagement Master's Program. And I got an email like a week ago and they were like, do you want to introduce Bell Hooks and Laverne Cox? And I walked out of my office and was screaming to our communications director. <laughs> and everyone thought that something was really wrong, but I was just that excited. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening to hear two, um, with you all this evening to hear two of the most treasured intellectuals and leaders share a stage. As an alumni, I am so proud that this extremely relevant event is happening tonight, and I am so humbled to have been asked to be part of it. Bell Hooks. Where do I even begin to introduce someone with such magnitude? She's one of the leading public intellectuals of our time. Her work is largely responsible for much of the contemporary analysis of race, class, and gender and has influenced millions on the ways we must dismantle oppression and create a just world that centers the voices of those most oppressed. Like many of you here tonight, I was first introduced to her work as a young and eager undergraduate student looking to understand what feminism was and if I could be part of it. Her work was a map and so much more. Every book that I was assigned, I devoured and I read over and over. Because of Bell Hooks' writing, I found ways of belonging as a queer, gender non-conforming Native American. I found tools to address my own rage associated with generations of genocide. I was also forced to be critical of the privilege I hold as someone with masculine and white skin passing privilege, and to think through the ways in which my silence was perpetuating white supremacy and colonization. To truly affect change and work towards liberation, Bell Hooks' work taught me that I must never be silent. Years later, it was Bell Hooks' work that single-handedly saved my life and forced me to fight for myself. This is where I'm gonna get really deep, Bell Hooks, so I apologize. I, I, told, I warned you. Um, at 26, uh, I went into drug rehab for a methamphetamine drug addiction. And prior to entering treatment, I had successfully isolated myself from any person or thing that was good in my life. I had many sleepless nights in those first six months sober as a result of coming off of drugs. And during those sleepless nights, I read all about love, new visions for the first time. <laughs> in all about love, she writes about breaking patterns in order to give and receive love. Her work gave me hope that I hadn't had in years as a result of addiction and isolation. It made me see that I was deserving of love and capable of giving love love that was centered in liberation. It gave me the courage to face my addiction and make life-changing decisions, including packing up everything I owned, borrowing $1,500 from my friend, and moving to New Mexico with one year sober and a job that didn't really pay. Um, so this move was the first act of self-love that I'd ever taken, and it's the move that eventually prepared me to move to New York City for graduate school, and later my job at ABP, working to end violence against LGBTQ people. So I suppose I owe Bell Hooks a major thank you for giving me the strength to love and to realize my full potential. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have the pleasure of introducing our next guest. I first met Laverne Cox in the summer of 2013 as she was taking the world by storm as the first transgender woman of color in a leading television role on Orange is the New Black. <laughs> and transcending perhaps every social and political boundary that's ever existed. We met at a cafe a few blocks from here to prepare for her upcoming award from ABP for her work to end violence against LGBTQ people. <coughs> and to discuss the ways that she might support AVP's community organizing efforts. 
As she walked in, I tried hard not to fall out of my chair in excitement or to embarrass myself by spilling coffee. I mean, it's really not every day that you get to meet the critically acclaimed Laverne Cox. That day, I met someone who would become a dear friend in life and the movement for social change. We talked about the need for trans leadership in the nonprofit industrial complex, our own experiences with violence based on our gender identities, and how the world must come to understand that a transgender woman of color walking down the street and being called a man is an act of violence. Violence that often escalates to deadly realities for transgender women of color. We talked about how we must demand justice for this violent epidemic, and justice doesn't include a reliance on the prison industrial complex and the impact it has on transgender people like Cece McDonald, who dared to live by defending herself against racist and transphobic hate violence, and as a result, served a 19-month prison sentence. We talked about how we need justice that dismantles transphobic structures and demand that the lives of transgender people be seen as valuable and loved. We talked about love as a revolutionary act, one that I'm certain bell hooks influence us both to understand. What is so incredibly valuable about thinkers and doers like bell hooks and Laverne Cox is that they push us beyond the present. They help us think about representation and help us reimagine ourselves outside of contrived oppressive myths such as we're living in a post-racial America or marriage is the litmus test of progress for LGBTQ people. <laughs> They force us to examine what liberation truly means and how we should fight to achieve it. Most importantly, their work reminds us that we cannot and will not be controlled by racism, transphobia, or patriarchy. They challenge us to call for another way of living, a way of living that is rooted in love and visibility. It is an honor that I introduce the both of you tonight. Can everyone please help me in welcoming Bell Hooks and Laverne Cox? anybody who appreciated their work, anybody who would read their work over and over again, anybody who felt that their life was in any way transformed or touched by their work. So that I come to you feeling the depths of deep blessing that my whole week here at the New School is not just about affirming the 20 years of teaching to transgress, but of me meeting so many people who are sharing with me how their work impacted, how my work impacted on their lives. And I, I just feel that that's awesome. And there isn't a time of my life that I don't feel tremendous gratitude. And the reason that I wanted to talk with Laverne is that I'm interested in what the work does outside the academy. We know a lot about what the work does inside the academy, that people read bell hooks, they write their papers, they have their discussions, but the fact that the work moves beyond the academy is something that we don't hear a lot about. So that when I heard, you know, as the song says, I heard it through the grapevine, that Laverne Cox was a be big bell hooks reader, not just a bell hooks reader, a big bell hooks reader, I felt like this is somebody I need to talk with. Okay. <laughs> so, so first of all, I, I, I honestly don't really feel worthy to, to share this space with you, um, um, Belle. I can't even believe you would say that. I, I, I do, and, and, it, and it's because I was, I, I, was, I was on the plane today, um, coming back to New York, and I was rereading Teaching to Transgress, and I just started, I just started crying uncontrollably on the plane. 
Um, Cause I was like, oh my God, I get to share space with this, with this woman who has changed my life, who was such, um, when I was a college student here in New York City, I went to Marymount Manhattan College, I discovered um, your work, um, Black Looks was the first book of yours that I read. And it was through my brother who's sitting on the, on the first row. It, I, it, I, it resonated with me so much because I knew that it was the truth that I knew that I was reading truth and, and there was this space uh, that, I, that I was able to claim around my race um, and the deep pain that I experienced growing up in the South um, as a black person with, with, with that legacy of intense racism that still exists there. But then also, there was this, they were, they were, you were having conversations and you were writing about um, um, unessentialized ideas of what it means to be a woman. So that moving away from these ideas of, of, of essentialized womanhood that, that held feminism back. And I found myself there as, as, a, as a gender non-conforming college student. I, I wasn't quite ready to accept my own womanhood, but I was, I was like, there might be a space for me here. And I saw, I was able to um, draw links between um, the, the bullying I experienced in my own life and the violence I experienced as a gender non-conforming person and how that was an attack on femininity. And, I, and it made me really um, begin to understand as a college student that we cannot talk about ending homophobia without talking about ending patriarchy, that we cannot talk right. about ending transphobia without talking about ending patriarchy. And, and, and also too, I, the, the, um, I love that you um, talked about pop culture and you did critical analysis of pop culture, that space that I longed to be in, but not uncritically. Right, I wanted to be in this space, but not uncritically. And so, so when I read a script now, I, so much of your work has influenced the way I read scripts and the way I read images. And, and now as a producer, the way I make images. And, and, and Shelby said a lot of amazing stuff that I hope I can live up to. And, and you have set a very high standard in your work that, that I would like, love to live up to. But, but the work for me goes, goes, I'm not in the academy. You know, I have an undergraduate degree in dance. Um, <laughs> But, 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 but the work of, of liberating ourselves is, is something that, that has, to, has to go out into um, spaces beyond um, the academy. Well, I mean, and that, that to me is the challenge of talking with Laverne because she occupies a very peculiar position that few people in the world of Hollywood <laughs> occupy in the sense of having awareness of the need to decolonize and at the same time working within a very colonizing system. So of course we want to hear about how she manages that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, oh gosh. Um, you know, the funny thing is, it's, it's, it's something I'm aware of that I'm constantly negotiating. And, it, and, and, and it's, it, it, I have, the, the funny thing is, I, um, is Janet Mock here tonight? Did Janet make it? I remember I was, um, I was heading up to um, Albany with Janet to um, every um, Quality and Justice Day in, um, f um, this, uh, in spring of 2013, and she was um, giving a talk, and I was going up for, um, to support um, the passage of the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, which still hasn't passed. Um, and we were on the train um, talking, and we were having this discussion, we started talking about race, and, and Janet said to me, I love this, um, Janet was like, you speak so eloquently about race, yet you so rarely talk about it publicly. And, and it was a read, it, it was a read. <laughs> but a very loving read, and, and it, was a, it was a loving read that I was able to hear. I acknowledged the moment, I was like, ooh, can I work? Um, and, and then I was sort of, and that made me think, and I was like, I was wondering like why, I was like, is this true? And I realized, I was like, yes, it is true. And, and, I, and I read my bell hooks, and I, and I, it, I I, I was awake, painfully aware that like it scares me to go on national television and use the phrase imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little, it's like my, I think part of my initial, you know, I, I, I had a little bit of a public platform starting six years ago. I did a little reality show that some of you know about. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm already black and trans. This is enough for people, right? And so I was like, I can't be too 
political, but I could, sort of couldn't help myself. And after that conversation with Janet, I was like, okay, what, what's going on here? And what is the fear? And I just decided what was actually, and what was great about Orange is the New Black um, is that it's a show, what was, and it still is great, is that it's a show that's set in a women's prison. And it's inherently political because it talks about incarceration, I think. Um, her face does um, <laughs> bell hooks things. And so I was, <laughs> So, so I was like, okay, I can talk about incarceration. I can talk about all these. I can talk. We can talk about race. So it, it sort of gave me permission, in a way, to just kind of go for it. And the first few times, I was really kind of scared to sort of go on TV and like be bold, and even in interviews, just sort of go there. And the, I, I found the more I go there. Um, the more I, I'm actually connecting with um, a lot of folks, and a lot of folks are hearing truth in that. And it is my truth and my critical analysis, and so I'm just, I'm going there more. Um, and it, and it, it's still scary. It's still really, really scary. Well, I'm not a big fan of Orange is the New Black, and part of what I, I love about the <laughs> is that <laughs> I, absolutely, absolutely. But I do find that one of the most compelling images on the show, one of the most progressive images on the show is the character of Sophia and her relationship with Crystal. I mean, earlier I've talked a lot about how in many black families, um, working with my students, and, and we talk about the fact that we rarely see adult black people talking to one another, adult black people in relationship, communicating, having a conversation, dealing with a conflict. And what's so amazing about Orange is the New Black in terms of the character of Sophia and Crystal is what we see represented, not just in there being this radical trans character, but in the way that they deal with conflict in the way that they address their issues. And it's so deep. It's, and one of my favorite books is a book called Conscious Loving. And in some ways, that's what we see represented. I mean, the, do you all remember when, if, you, if you've watched the show, when Sophia's character is wanting Crystal to bring in the drugs, you know, and the, the, the hormone drugs and things. And Crystal just gives this brilliant read about, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you know, I have this child, I have, but it's all done with a level of grace and care and compassion. And I think for viewers to see that is amazing. It's am an amazing intervention because it has this quality of real communication and at the same time, compelling people to watch people who are different engaged in a meaningful dialogue. I, I find that to be so amazing. And one thing that's really clear to us is things are not either or. You know, Orange is the New Black is not either like all bad or all good, but, and, and neither is media. That more often than not, images in media are mixed and, it, and it's hard for us then because what's the language to talk about them? What's the language to talk about her progressive image in her character, Sophia, and all those other tired ass black women that are just reproducing so many stereotypes um, in the things that they say and do. Um, and yet, I mean, I was fascinated by Orange is the New Black because so many people cross race, cross class, cross sexual practice, um, age, everything, were entranced by this show. And I wanted to, to really understand what is going on here that captivates so many people. Can you tell us a little bit? Well, I, I we will agree to disagree on some of that. I'm, I'm completely biased. I'm an actor on the show, oh, so and, and, and I personally I love our show. No, no, no. I, and I love our show, but I think what what I've often said about our show is that, and and I like to um, 
to quote Susan Batson, quoting Deborah Messing in her book, in her, Susan Batson's um, book on acting truth. She says, um, Deborah Messing says that people do not go to the movies to see you, they go to see themselves. And I do feel like a lot of our, the folks who are fans of the show are seeing themselves in these characters. I find the storytelling is really compelling and it makes folks want to find out what happens next. And, and I think the diversity is a huge part of that. Um, that's so. what I hear a lot as I went around and canvassed people, how much the diversity meant to them, how for many women of color, black women viewers, just seeing that many black women together on the screen um, is, is, is empowering. And, I, and I, I don't think that our character, I think on the surface our characters might, some of our characters might seem like stereotypes, but I think we, what is the brilliance of our show is that we get into their backstories and we get into, begin to understand um, who they are as human beings um, beyond what we might see on the surface. So I think um, we have very complicated um, characters in, in the women of our Of course, show. I don't see it as brilliance. I see it as um, the really smart seduction because Part of, part of what's interesting and fascinating about the backstories is that they seduce you into feeling that there is this kind humanity operating when in some ways for me, the, the, there's a lot of meanness that gets acted. And again, her character is not part of the meanness. We never see you being cruel or thinking evil thoughts or evil intentions towards everyone I mean, is I that is that is profoundly human, though. I think my, my job my job as an actor is to sort of tell the truth of the human condition, and I think the reality is that we as human beings do have mean thoughts about people. Well, why don't you have some on the show? <laughs> Trust me, I do. I I, I don't want to no, give I anything mean, away for season three, but hold her, hold her, hold on. <laughs> I, I do, I, I, I do, I, 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 the, Sophia absolutely does. Well, I won't be looking at season three because I don't want to have my bubble burst. I, I, I love the way that she is both trans and transcendent. And I, I don't want to have to witness that sort of little fall to earth. But we're not going to spend all our time talking about Orange is the New Black. We are, we are going to talk more about that whole question of how do we live our lives, um, living and loving justice. Because part of what's happened to Laverne in her journey, to Janet Mock, to many trans folks, is going deep into a commitment and a love of justice. Not just for trans folks, but for, for all of the, the groups of people that are oppressed and suffering. And, and so part of, I mean, I, I was getting on her case because she's working really hard these days, going a lot of places, but part of why she's doing so much is having that power of voice where you can speak out for justice, um, where you can speak out against different wrongs. And so can you tell us a little bit about that transformation in your own life? Where, she, where she's told us she started out in a place of uncertainty, in a place of not being self-loving, and then she, she, she moved and moved and moved, and then here you are, a little goddess for justice. <laughs> I, it, it is, I think that the piece of, of coming to voice is, is crucial, and I think, it's, I think we all have a voice, and finding that voice is, is, is part of it, and then having that voice elevated. I think that, I, I believe in the power of storytelling and telling our stories and, and owning that. And what I've been, as I've been rereading some of my bell hooks, I, I, one of the biggest things is there's so much talk of, of pain and yearning in, in the work that it was sort of, sort of these, these um, transformative experiences, and particularly in teaching the transgressor, you talk about that in, in the classroom, sometimes it is deeply painful to, to let go of what we thought we knew. And I think that is so much of what needs to happen in, in the world around us um, if for free folks to really have justice, because I think it is our points of view 
And that's, that's why your work was so crucial to me at, at, when I was a college student, that it was, the, it was my point of view um, that changed. I began to see the world differently. And so I think a lot, we have to be willing to come to these new spaces of consciousness um, first. And then once we are there, to stay there and not be, you know, th there, there is the thing of being an actress in Hollywood and like, sort of trying to sort of be, have a mainstream career and try not, trying to bring people in and not alienate them and, and still come um, hold the courage of my convictions. And it, 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 it feels like a tightrope sometimes, but I, I, what I love is that, um, not to promote another project I'm doing, but um, I have a, a documentary called The Laverne Cox Presents the T-Word that's going premiering on MTV next week. And what I'm so excited about is that there are seven young people in this documentary from the ages of 12 to 24 who are coming to voice and who want to, I think it's courageous for transgender folks to, to, to step out of their houses as themselves and, and, and live right. their truth. All right. Because we live in a world that is constantly telling us that we are not who we say we are, that stigmatizes us, criminalizes us, profiles us, objectifies us. And so for these seven young people to go on national television, not just seeking some fame, but um, wanting to make a difference in the world around them, hungry for that and longing for that. And so part of what I, I, I would like to do with this platform that I have is to give, you know, extend it to, to other people so that they can also um, come to voice. Which is part of what I felt my mission was with my work. That how can I create work that goes beyond me and aids not just in the politicization and the, the development of critical consciousness, but that actually promotes healing. And I think that being in the academic world where such work is really traditionally very devalued. I mean, how can I not be ecstatic thinking that some of you are here to hear me, that it's not all Laverne. <laughs> but th thank you. My brother's like, I'm here for you, Belle. <laughs> yes. We do have to pause for a minute and just acknowledge the role Lamar played in introducing my work um, to Laverne as well. No, yeah, my brother is like obsessed with bell hooks. Like he's, a, he's literally obsessed and he talks about the work all the time and quotes and is constantly rereading and, and it's influenced his work a lot and I would not have um, come to um, your work without my brother. So um, do you want to stand up for the people? This is my show business thing. This is my brother. We just don't want them to be this little love fest. But at the same time, I think it is important. Um, you know, when Laverne said that she didn't want to be, um, you know, sort of pushing her own show, why not? You know, why not glory in the things that we have accomplished? Um, you know, it's these journeys that we've taken to self actualization have not been easy journeys. And so, I mean, people see you or they read a book and, and, and it feels like, oh, well, she's made it. She's, but in fact, there's so much about the journey um, that, that isn't there in the words, um, that isn't, because there is the real lived experience of the journey. And no matter how popular Lorraine Cox becomes, Orange is the New Black, she still has to go out into this mean world of hatred that we, as people of color, as people of varied sexual identities and practices, will always, until we change the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, have to confront. And so the question becomes, what gives us the strength and the power to confront and to change? I mean, those are the issues that dominate my life and my thinking. What gives us? that will to change. The poet Charles Olson says, what does not change is the will to change. So how do we harness that? Um, so here's a hard question. So do you want to do more projects that don't 
have the tension of stereotypes or whatever, but are just purely about, like the documentary, that are about advancing um, hope and possibility? <laughs> or do you think, I mean, can Hollywood lend itself to that? Can there be uh, amazing dramas? Um, can, we, can we just let Crystal and Laverne have their own show, Crystal and Sophia? Um, and, and what would that drama look like? I, I, well, I would look to your work for, for some of the answers. You, you, you used um, write so brilliantly about how market forces influence so much of what, um, how we see <clears throat> what, it, what gets made. And I think, you know, when, when Gigi Komen talks about, um, you know, going to a network and pitching a show about, you know, women of color in prison, there's not going to be a show. So she, 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 she talked very um, candidly about the fact that, that, that having this white woman who's even blonde um, you know, as a sort of tour guide, you know, as the way to sort of get something made, that is, that is the world that we live in. And, and, and that, that's, that's just the reality. In terms of me, I, I love acting. <clears throat> I mean, it's very, but the very, very much the same way you talk about just love being a writer. Like you just, there's this desire to write. There has just been this desire in me since I was very young to, to get up and perform and to act. And that is what I love doing most. So I want to find ways to do that. I certainly want to um, um, produce um, a scripted work for myself, as vehicles for myself. And we're in the process of, of uh, working on some of that. Um, but I just want to act at the end of the day. And then I want to also ideally create spaces where, where people can be, be feel that they're free and feel like they have a voice and can express themselves as themselves. And what I love about the way in which you talk about uh, film, for example, that, that we can create the worlds that we want to see. And that is the wonderful thing about being an artist. And so, so that's what I do long to do um, as a filmmaker in the future. Um, it, that's, it's probably a ways to get there, getting movies made and, and getting the right people attached and the right script and all that stuff. It's a whole intense process. Um, I, for me, it's a balance because I, I want to just, there's a part of me that just wants to be an artist and wants to create. I certainly understand that this is not an apolitical um, endeavor. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer, but that's Well, it is right. an interesting answer. I was thinking about those shoes she's wearing um, and her hair because, um, I mean, that's one, one of the, the, Issues, I think, that many people have with trans women is the, the sense of a traditional femininity um, being called out and, and reveled in the, a, a femininity that many people, many feminist women feel like, oh, we've been trying to get away from that. Can you talk about that a little bit? I love that you brought that up. I think the important thing to remember for me is that a lot of trans women do not embrace this kind of femininity. A lot of trans women, um, you know, don't wear high heels and don't wear makeup and, and feel oppressed by that. My choice is to wear, you know, to all this fun bit show business. Um, I mean, show business, but some of it is just about what. I find aesthetically pleasing for myself, trying to, you know, I've had, I've gone through lots of phases where I've had braids and where I've like, you know, been sort of androgynous, with this very sort of androgynous phase. Um, and this is where I feel empowered, ironically, and comfortable. Um, I think that it's important to, to note that all trans women are not embracing this, that this trans woman does, and this trans woman feels empowered by this. And, and I don't think, and, and it's something I have to say, it's something that I wrestle with, you know, having an understanding of your work and an understanding of patriarchy. And it's like, am I, you know, sort of feeding into the patriarchal gaze when I can, you know, in my yes. blonde wigs and, you know, so, but it is, and I think that's an issue, and my brother's like, yes, 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 one. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm just sort of like, okay, here I am, you know, if, if I'm embracing a patriarchal gaze with this, with this presentation, um, it's the way I, fi I found um, something that feels empowering. And I think, and I think the, the really honest answer is that I have not wanted to, I've, I've um, sort of constructed myself in a way so that, I don't, so that I don't want to disappear. And I think so often there is an erasure, and, and, and I like to add cis-normative, heteronormative, imperialist, white, Princess Capitalist Patriarchy, where there's an erasure. 
where there's an erasure of, of certain bodies and certain identities. And I have not ever been interested in, in being invisible and being erased. And so a lot of how, and, how I'm, I guess, negotiating these systems of, of, of oppression um, is in, in trying not to be erased is perhaps buying into or playing into some uh, some of these ideas, of some of these the patriarchal gaze, you know, the white, this white supremacy. I, I suppose what I hear are two things in that, not, not that you wish to perpetuate the patriarchy, but that to think of Michelle Wallace's work on invisibility blues, yeah. that the desire to be seen, to be visible, I think is, is, is a desire that we have to recognize. And we have to continually critique the fact that Laverne Cox, Beyonce, dare I say, um, <laughs> We talked about this earlier in the Whose Booty Is This panel that- I love that title, by the way. <laughs> the long blonde or near blonde locks um, speak to a larger audience than, I mean, we said, would white people be following after uh, Beyonce as if she was up there bouncing with her nappy locks, her um, you know, short afro or what have you, we can't dismiss how, how certain representations allow us greater visibility within the existing social structure. And I hear Laverne honestly owning, I want that greater visibility. I don't, I don't make these choices uncritically. I, I really don't. It's not, it's not like I'm sort of like blindly yeah, thinking that this, is, that this is apolitical. I, I don't think that any of this is apolitical in, in, in white supremacy. I don't think any of this is apolitical in a patriarchal culture. It is all political and it's, and it's complicated. Um, it, it, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> it's 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 very tricky, and I but I but I don't think it make this this presentation makes me any less aligned with with feminist politics, with anti um, you know white supremacist politics, with with wanting to create spaces of freedom because I love natural hair and I love you know under underneath my lace wig I I, I, I don't relax my hair and I have cornrows and I'm learning to I've learned to embrace and love this. It's just not something that I, I choose to you know, show the world. Um, well, I think the very fact that you can name it, I mean, most black women dealing in that kind of politics of representation get pissed off if, if you try to get them to name it. You know, the lace wig or, or, or their relationship to it. But I think the important, the important thing to, for me to think of too, I was in a conversation with my friend Kokuma in um, Chicago about this same notion. She, she asked me, yeah, Kokuma's fierce. She interviewed me for her, um, her magazine that has yet to come out. She was like, I had a preview. Um, she was saying, you know, do you feel your proximity to white supremacist beauty ideals has in, in, you know, increased your, you know, sort of success? And I was like, work. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think, and, and Part of what I said is that I think that, that this whole thing of whiteness is is a construct. Nobody is as white as, as, as they think they are. You know, that there is this whole sort of culture that is reproducing itself, that is cer certainly there's certain bodies are not privileged, certainly certain experiences are not privileged, um, but, but, but it's all sort of a construct, right? <laughs> that it's all a construct, but some constructs allow for greater freedom than others. Some constructs allow people to have better well-being than others. And that's the challenge for us to be able to create identities um, that allow us the largest range of optimal well-being. I mean, I was struck last night when I was on this stage with Gloria Steinem, and you know, we all know if you follow bell hooks, I can be witty and flip. But one thing I said that, that I reflected on in the wee hours of the morning was I was talking about, you know, my endless search for love and whether or not um, the heteronormative woman can be with a man in patriarchy. And I was especially saying, you know, the age appropriate men for someone like me all tend to be deeply mired in patriarchy. But my point that I made, that I reflected on, was that I live in a house that loves me. That everything in that house 
reflects my love of the culture that I come from, um, art, um, beauty surrounds me, and I always say, you know, when I open the door to my house, I feel as though these arms um, are reaching out and embracing me. And, you know, I've lived in a house with a violent man. I've lived in a house with a violent black man. I lived in the house with the violent black male father. And I know the difference about, in terms of what that house can be like. Um, and so that I do think that it's important for us to name the conditions under which we can have optimal well-being. It's important to name what aids us in our decolonization process. I mean, I said earlier, decolonization, like recovery from alcohol or drug addiction, isn't something that happens like once. OK, I decolonize my mind, and <laughs> I can keep on stepping. It's a constant vigilance within our culture. It's a constant practice. Exactly. The practice of freedom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's definitely read, read her bell hooks. Um, but it, it, and it isn't, we don't want to sit up here and act like it's an easy practice. Because I'm sure, you know, look at how many black, individual black stars in the world of Hollywood. Sometimes it's as people soar um, that the pressures become more intense. Um, and I think that the question becomes how to maintain that balance, that equanimity. How can Laverne maintain um, the integrity of being that she has worked hard to cultivate while you know, working within a system that does not value integrity and integrity of being. And that's, that's, that's her challenge. That's her vocational challenge. And who knows where it will necessarily lead her. She might get tired of it all in some form or, or need to um, establish her own sense. I mean, I got tired of academe. I felt like academe was so much like the dysfunctional family that if I stayed in it, um, in the way that I was in it, I would never be well. Because all of the ingredients of the dysfunctional family were present there. And for me, I had to create a distance, but I didn't leave academe completely. I had to create the level of engagement that would allow me to maintain my integrity of self and being. And of course, whenever we do that, there are sacrifices involved. You know, I'll be here tomorrow with Cornell, but I don't make the big money that Cornell makes, but I don't do what Cornell does either, because I didn't want to be within certain frameworks uh, that he has chosen to remain within. But, so we have to understand that our, our choices have consequences, and that, you know, we don't know what Laverne will face as she rises, because she is a star on the rise. Um, I, however, was a little bit upset that as we walked here arm in arm, I expected people to be falling over themselves. Oh, Laverne Cox, and nobody fell over themselves. Uh, no, nobody stopped. Honestly, it was, it was lovely to have a moment on the street with bell hooks with not, you know, it was lovely for me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I also wanted to say how important it is because there are certain folks, um, certain folks who call themselves radical feminists who are not accepting of trans, trans women. All right. Um, and who, and that's another reason I was very, I was very emotional coming here today because I, I, I was hoping that this, this moment could, could model um, for other folks what this kind of um, thing can look like. I was wondering if you, um, um, as, as, a, as a thinker who's taught, written extensively about um, expanding our ideas of womanhood, um, what your, some of your thoughts are, perhaps, as, a, as, a, as the feminist, in my opinion? Um, well, I mean, I just did a conference at Berea, which was called, you know, Queer for a Day, Queer Now and Always. So truthfully, I would probably get rid of all of these categories of trans and whatever, and we would just all be queer. And the, the demands of queerness would be, as Baldwin writes in the male prison, and nobody knows my name, would be that we would have to work out 
what our cells are, because you know, we are works in progress, and very few of us are static in the way we grow. You know, who knows what, what life will take Laverne to. You know, I often say in my work, I take my community where I find it. You know, when I think about my search for love, yeah, I might have an ideal in my mind of who it is I could partner with, um, and life might bring me completely someone that does not meet that ideal, but that is loving. And then that's a challenge. Will I, will I choose to love, or will I stay attached to, to my ideal in some way that keeps that love from me? And that, that to me, is so much um, harder to think about. I mean, the, the way we use labels and the way labels um, isolate people, and what, what does it mean to imagine a world where we're not bound by la labels? I'm always talking about Frank Browning's book, A Queer Geography, because I feel like it's one of the few books where he tries to say, you know, identity politics has its place, but the more important place in our lives is who we connect with, uh, who we find we can love, and we don't always connect with the people that are just like us, um, or the people whom we say, okay, I feel like I'm a trans ally myself, but I don't connect with any trans person that I meet. You know, I met Janet months ago, um, and I, I didn't realize I'd been put on the stage that I was gonna give a talk with Janet Mock. And I thought, I don't know that this is for me, I don't know this person. <laughs> and I, I have read her book, and I was sitting in my hotel lobby, and in walked Janet. And there was that spirit that often happens in our lives of instant recognition, of a sense of, here is someone that I can relate to. And then I took her book and I read it all night, because you know I have to read my one book a day, my nonfiction book. And Janet and I were having breakfast the next day, and she just couldn't believe that I had cared enough to read her entire book and to be able to address it with her. And I think that those sense of connections um, are very deep. And recently, when Janet was supposed to come to Kentucky, and one, one of my sisters was like, well, I'm not coming to your house because she's an abomination. Uh, or and then she changed, she wanted to come, but she didn't want to meet the abomination. And there are times then in our life when we have to choose, and I had to say, well, you're gonna have to stay away. Because I don't allow that kind of violence. Um, I don't feel like, oh, it's okay. I can just explain to you that this person has violent feelings about who you are. Not so, there are times when we have to stand for justice, and there are times in standing for justice, we have to turn away from people that we would ordinarily maybe want to, to be with. And that, that is a difficult part of struggle. Um, I have so, but it's like I'm here with bell hooks, and I want to say so many things. Um, but but I keep coming. You keep you keep, you talk about love. You've been talking a lot about love here. You talk a lot about. Yeah, I try love to get into work. her love life, but she, she you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we talk on the phone, I was like, well, well, you know, I've been searching for love. What about you? <laughs> The thing, the thing is, like, unfortunately, when you are an actor on a popular TV show, people want to be all up in your love life. And so I think it's actually been really important for me to have some boundaries around that publicly, um, talking about that. But I'm talking, I, I think, for me, the love of, of, of ourselves and each other. I, I think about the yes, world that we yes. live in that is so polarized, a world that we live in that we don't know how to have conversations without yelling at each other when we have differences. How, and, and, and I think about your work, and I think about how, how you talk so beautifully about creating safe spaces in the classroom, specifically in teaching the transgress, um, where, you can have, where folks feel safe to have conversations. And I think a lot of that is about love and, and but I have to interrupt you because I actually am crit critical of the notion of safety in my work. And what I want is people to feel comfortable in the circumstance of risk. 
um, because I think that if we wait for safety, the bell hooks that wasn't sure that she could get on the stage with Janet Mock would never have gotten on that stage. The bell hooks that was afraid of, what if I use the word wrong words? What if I say the wrong thing? Um, I, would, I would have stopped myself. And so that, to me, I'm very interested in what does it mean for us to cultivate together community that allows for risk. Um, the risk of knowing someone outside your own boundaries. Um, the risk that is love. There is no love that does not involve risk. I'm a little wary because white people love to evoke the safe spaces. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so I, I tend, have a tendency to be critical of that. But I do believe that learning takes place in the harmonious space, the space that you and I are embodying tonight, where I'm not agreeing with language. you. I like that harmonious space. That I, I love that. But I think it is, it, for me, it is like so, so many of the risks that I have taken in my life, I've had to, I've had to have some kind of support um, All right. um, it, behind me to let me know that I would be OK and that I, if, if this didn't quite work out, that they would still love me. That is, that is really what I'm talking about, how we have the, when we feel like that someone's not going to turn their backs on us or demonize us when we go and take that risk and maybe make, say the, use the wrong pronoun or, or say the wrong thing. I'm terrified of saying the wrong thing if you're on stage with bell hooks. Uh, <laughs> you know, but here we are. Here we are. And I, but I think that what allows us then to be in that space is loving kindness. It is what love is that allows us to be in that space where we don't agree, where we may see things totally different. I can tell you, I'll never be wearing a pair of high heel shoes as long as I live. <laughs> I, I did at one point in my life, um, you know, but it's like there are changes that you make in your life, and there are probably so many changes Laverne's going to make in her life. I'm afraid I'm a lot older than her. Um, <laughs> She won't tell me how many years older I am, but, but I know that it's a lot. Um, so that I think that um, one of the things that is the opposite of the safe space is to cultivate in one another the courage. Um, the courage to be self-actualized, the, the, the realization that you have to choose to be who you are. I love this book. And of course, I would forget the, the author's name. It's a black um, psychiatrist, and it's a book about emotional longevity. And in the book, he talks about, that's the title, uh, what it takes to live a good life, a life of optimal well-being. And he does, in fact, say that one needs the community base, the support base, um, to thrive. But one also has to have that sort of core strength to persevere. And you use that word and talk about what it means to persevere uh, and what it means to move forward in the face of, I mean, what trans person who has moved forward in this society <laughs> has not had to persevere um, and to move through many, many obstacles. And the obstacles don't stop. Money won't make the obstacles stop. Money won't make the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy go away. Um, now, it can facilitate how much of it you have to deal with. So I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to be one of those people who lies about the uses of money. Because money, as a facilitator, is crucial. And I want to say to every black woman in this room, girl, get your money straight. Um, because. A lot of our sense of empowerment and freedom will come in whether or not you can, in fact, say no to many things. And you can't say no to many things if you feel like, if I say no to this, I can't eat, I can't pay my rent, or, or what have you. Um, I always say to people that if you ask me, I always like to pretend that you know, I'm up in heaven, and you know, God is asking me, well, Belle, uh, what was it that you liked the most? And I, I would always answer that what I most wanted for myself was to be able to be free. And to me, that meant to be economically in control of my life, um, to be self-loving, to all of those things. 
um, and that life has allowed me to have that is, is a tremendous, to me, gift uh, and a tremendous need to share with others. I have a friend who keeps insisting that, Val, when are you going to write the money book? Um, because I'm interested in how we live our lives financially and how it impacts our self-concept, what we are able to do. I, I think about going, you know, to give a talk somewhere and the, the white woman host is just really being so nasty to me and treating me and I'm sitting thinking there, you know, this is, this is like slavery. This person feels that she has paid for me and she can treat me um, just terribly. And so, you know, I turned to her and, and I said to her, because this is the thing about Buddhism that can be fun. Buddhism teaches you that you don't have to get angry. I just turned to her and I say, you know, didn't you tell me that you've sold thousands of tickets um, to people to hear about hooks tonight? Well, I'm going to go in this store, and I suggest that when I come out of the store, you change your attitude and your way of speaking to me, or you will have to give back all that money that you got for those tickets. And it's a, it's a kind of clarity. I know a lot of you didn't like the James Brown movie, and I keep talking about how people talk about James Brown, but there's a marvelous moment in the James Brown movie. And if you haven't seen it, I think you should see it, where he thinks he's going to be top billing at a concert. But in fact, he gets there and he finds that the Rolling Stones, the white boys, are going to get the top billing. And he first feels such a rage and anguish of spirit. Then he says, then I realized that you have to flip it. And his way of flipping it was to come out as the last show and be so fabulous that people would leave there thinking James Brown. And I think that that's the constant uh, way in the decolonized mind, because let's face it, he wasn't decolonized in many other ways. But when it came to his work as a musician, he had a wisdom about things that he needed to do. But I think we all need to have ways in our life where we flip it, where, I mean, for me to practice not being so attached to money that I act like, oh, if I'm going to be well paid, it's OK for people to treat me any kind of way, you know, to, to feel as though they own me. Um, and so that that sense of being free uh, being independent is so crucial to me. There were there were so many years I I waited I worked in restaurants here in New York City. And if anyone anyone has ever done that, you know that they could be very um, dehumanizing. And I and I for many years I stayed in these restaurants because I'm a black trans woman. I'm like I'm just gonna go and get a job somewhere. Um, <laughs> and so I, I put up with a lot of stuff. And I think that is that is the thing of having uh, having some money where you can say no. There was I, you know for me that really wasn't an option for many, many years. I had to do whatever. And I think a lot of folks can relate where they can't, you can't just go in and quit your job or just say that I, you know, I put up with all kinds of stuff. Um, I, 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 again, I wanted to go back to this, this um, sort of this question, because I think, you know, I think that the important piece around high, the high heels, I, would, I guess a little bit about the high heels, and, and you say you won't wear high heels. I think the piece is that we, for me anyway, is that we don't demonize the woman who is in high heels, and we don't demonize the woman who's out of high heels. I think there is, there is a culture that, um, particularly that I work in in mainstream media, that wants to say that all women should be in heels and all that. I think that's ridiculous. I think it's really how do we begin to celebrate um, all the ways in which we want to comport ourselves and not say that one person is more feminist than the other, and, and so that we can again find ways to, to come together across difference. I think it's difficult because some people are more feminist than others. Um, <laughs> the fact is. Um, this is why we love Bell Hooks. <laughs> That, that, I mean, one thing, this is something that's been on my mind lately and it's been disturbing me is that if feminism is all things to all people, then what is it? I mean, if we, how do we locate it as a radical um, political movement in our lives if everybody just makes of it, um, which doesn't mean that we should demonize, but we do have to be clear about what are the boundaries. Um, that what, what is the line that you cross that you, you can, in fact, 
um, say, I'm a feminist, like for me, and my students will say, well, I'm an anti-abortion, but I'm a feminist. And I'll say, but that, that is impossible because you can be, you can say, I would never choose to have an abortion because I don't support that for myself. But there is no one who's genuinely a feminist who doesn't support reproductive rights for women. Um, and it's, again, I mean, it's so hard for us because we live in this binary world that's always saying choose one thing or the other. I don't try to get someone to choose um, my values about abortion, but I do feel that the, part of the essence of feminism is that women have control over women's bodies, that women have reproductive rights, all women. Um, and so you can't want to take that away from somebody and then brag about how feminist you are. Um, but it's, it's, again, a complex because I, I feel more, you know, one of the concepts that I've written about that I, it matters to me is radical openness. And as you know, if you walk around the streets with me or sit around in the hotel with me, I pretty much like to be open to everyone. And that doesn't mean that, and, and that becomes a question of, you know, where do you draw the line? Where do, where do, you, where do you say, well, this person um, isn't worthy? And I try not to engage that kind of rhetoric because I see it as so central to domination, the choice that some people are worthy and some people are not. But radical openness requires discernment. It requires, again, a critical vigilance about how you live your life, you know. Um, so as we begin to close here and open up for questions, um, what about spirituality, Laverne Cox? Does that have a role in your life? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's my own sort of spirituality. I, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, and I don't subscribe to any sort of organized religion, but, but I pray, and I, I've begun to meditate and find ways. For me, it's about connecting to a power that's greater than myself, and that has been really crucial for me at this stage in my life as, as my life gets bigger and I get busier. That, um, the only thing I can often find to ground me is a sense of, of, of prayer and, and connecting to a higher power. So it's actually deeply crucial for me. I would say the same thing for me too, that that's been part of my, I mean, there just have been times, I mean, when I was leaving New York and I felt so overwhelmed by the games people play in New York and the games of fame. And um, the, I kept thinking before I left here that I could, I would drown myself in the bathtub. You know, um, and, I, and you know how when you think those kind of crazy sorts of thoughts, I was like, you know, you don't have to drown yourself in the bathtub, honey. You can just leave town. <laughs> um, but I, I remember the level of stress that I felt as I was trying to leave town. And I was outside my apartment waiting for the car to come and I was mad because the car wasn't there. I was on the phone yelling and screaming, and of course I wasn't calling the right car service. And in the process, I also noticed that I had on two mismatched shoes, and um, it just was all such a sign of the part of me that was breaking down, that was shattering, and that needed to find the, the safe place for myself, the location. You know, when Sweet Honey in the Rocks say that, you know, you, you, if you've lost yourself, you gotta return to the place where you remember yourself and your being. And so that that sense of finding those locations that nourish us, um, that, that help us to take care of our spirit is so crucial. So we hope for Laverne Cox that she finds more and more of those places as she moves into greater and greater stardom um, and that we will all be watching her so we will now close and open up for some questions. Does anyone have a question? I think that you could go to the, the, the microphones on either side. 
microphones on either side. Don't be shy. Say your name. Hi, I'm Marco. Um, hi. Uh, so I don't know if you guys saw on your way in, but there are a lot of students organizing around the issue of the lack of gender inclusive bathrooms at the new school. Um, so this has, uh, this has been a long fight. It's, uh, this is just one incarnation of students organizing around this issue. And I wanted to know your thoughts on how at a university that practices uh, inclusion supposedly and preaches diversity in many ways, um, doesn't have inclusive bathroom settings. and has broken promises that in the new building there would be these bathrooms and now there aren't. And I wanted to know how, um, what your thoughts are about navigating these spaces where in this academic environment where you learn one thing in the classroom and you practice one other thing in the, the campus, how do you deal with the erasure, the erasure? Um, okay, uh, okay, we sorry, got it. I'll stop. Um. <laughs> Well, in teaching the trade course, you talk about theory and practice and bringing those two things together. Um, what is the administration, to, to, I mean, this is another question, but what are they saying to you about why it's not happening? What is, is there a reason? What is the funding when you just change the sign on the bathroom? <laughs> multiple times to describe someone you knew as a child and Laverne Cox's character, Sophia, on Orange is the New Black. And I was just wondering, um, as a trans person myself, what was your decision behind using that word and what are your feelings on it? Well, usually my feelings on using a word is, is am I mirroring the word that I hear the person using um, to describe themselves? Um, and in those cases, that's, that's what I was doing. Now, I don't know. Uh, if that would be what Sophia's character would describe herself. So, there you have it. Um, I got a tweet about your use of the word transsexual. That, that was, that oh, that was you. Hey. <laughs> I guess work. So, uh, you know, the, it, language is, Language is also a place of struggle, yeah. to quote bell hooks from yearning. Um, and language is really, uh, for, for trans folks, is, is this highly contentious place. They're, they're, Facebook recently added you know, 55 custom genders, and a lot of times people don't know what to say. There's a lot of trans folks, um, tr there's a lot of trans folks who don't like the word transgender. A lot of, I mean, they identify as transsexual, and they feel they don't want to be under this umbrella term that's inclusive of all people who are gender non-conforming or gender variant. So there's a lot of trans people who embrace the term transsexual, and then some people think that it is antiquated and that it should not be used anymore that it is part of, 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 a, of a system um, historically that is you know privileged a certain kind of transition so I, 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 I err on with 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 Ms. Hooks that it really is about the, what the individual likes to call themselves and, and and using that so that it is an individual decision and I, I, I just I prefer trans I was asked this on national television and people are very confused about transgender versus transsexual I like trans it's just it's a lot easier um, <laughs> to deal with but then I think it again is a about the individual, yeah. so. It, so. It just seemed like it was being used as an all-encompassing term, and that was just my, like, how I understood you using it. 
Thank you. Your, your name? Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, thank you both for sharing your time with us. My question is um, to both of you, um, how, what are some of the most important ways that you rest and recharge? I think we both uh, would acknowledge that prayer and stillness and meditation is one of the ways that we rest and recharge. Uh, I, I say often that I live the slug life rather than the thug life. <laughs> lots of time to rest. I mean, one of the struggles that I've been having here in New York is that I'm a nap taker, and a lot of these talks are taking place during my nap time. Um, what about you? Uh, yeah, prayer, meditation, just trying to get enough sleep, honestly. And then what I've also found that is actually really important, and it's become hard with my schedule, I have a very intense schedule, to connect with people um, that I love and who love me. That yes. really deeply recharges me, and I have to make time for that. Sorry to all my friends who haven't seen me. <laughs> I'm working on it. Thanks. Hi, my name is Lane. My question is for Ms. Cox. Um, so how do you speak your truth as one individual who happens to be trans when you're often forced into being a stand-in or a spokesperson for the community at large? Uh, um, it's, <laughs> it's hard, but I, do, I speak my truth. That is, I, that is what I do. And then I try to also acknowledge, like I just did with the question around um, language, that some trans people feel this way and some trans people feel that way. I can only really represent myself, but I, but I try to stay as abreast of, what, of the issues as possible. And I try to talk to as many trans folks as I can about what their experiences are, what they're going through, so that when I'm called to, to answer that I have some sort of evidence beyond my own experience. I love the moment in teaching to transgress too. When, uh, when you talked about moving from, from the authority of experience to the passion of experience. So that it, was, it was a place that was sort of through the body. Um, and it was really a beautiful moment. So our experiences are important and I, and I, and I tell my own story, but I also try to, as much as possible, elevate other people's stories. And I, 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 I'll, when I when I give speeches, I often talk about you know someone else's experiences as I didn't know them, so that we can understand that um, the reality is I'm a very privileged <laughs> trans person. Well, recently, I'm very privileged. <laughs> um, you know, I was barely paying my rent, like you know, about a year and a half ago. Um, so. I, that that is how I that is how I negotiate. It is my experience, but then my experience can also encompass um, talking to other trans people about their experiences and incorporating that into um, how I how I communicate. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks. I just want to say, both of you, I'm so glad that you're here, and I admire both of you so much. Um, my name's Jen, and I'm queer. I identify more specifically as a lesbian, and. Um, I have a lot of gender non-conforming people and specifically trans people in my family and my friend group and so often when I'm talking to other people about their experiences or my own, I encounter problems with people that identify as allies or feminist and they have these notions that um, come across as offensive to me or when they speak they say things like, oh they're trans, like I never would have thought that. Or, um, and I shudder to even think of defining sex at all, but they consider certain things not sex or certain things sex. And when you're speaking with people that are so confident in their feminism or their allyness, how do you personally speak to these people when they make statements that offend you about this? I, it's, I try not to become offended, which is a weird thing. <laughs> I try not to take it. I, I love the four agreements. Yeah, I was going to say that too. Four, so I don't take anything personally. The four, if you don't know the four agreements, look into it. It's major. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't take anything personally, so I understand that it's not personal. And I mean, there was a moment when I was, I was in a conversation with someone, and they, they, they used the term mulatto. And I was like, and I had a moment, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. You know what it is. Anyway. Um, but they used the term mulatto, and I was sort of like, well, it's my understanding that this is an anti- I was just very calm and loving. This is an antiquated term, and I think, you know, that goes, looks to a certain era. I think a lot of folks prefer maybe biracial or mixed race. You know, I just said it lovingly, and the person sort of 
I had a little freak out and left. <laughs> but you, but you say it. But you say it. But I think it's important. I think if if I, if, I, if you do, if you lose your cool, they're not gonna be able to hear you. One of the um, things that, that that you said that my that my brother told me about um, is that sometimes people don't hear what you say; they hear the way you say it. So your tone is so important. So if you can manage to stay calm in these moments and just gently correct them, and and, and maybe open it up so that this, so that they don't. They're not on defense, but you can have a conversation about it. Um, and try well, not to I'm going to have to calmly tell you that you are taking too long to answer questions because we only have so much time. And I'm very long-winded. Excuse me, Mel. <laughs> um, but and we want to get all of these questions that are up here. Um, we want to give people a chance. Did I do that lovingly enough? <laughs> You did it in the way that we will always love you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tony Lynn. Um, Bell, I hear you, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, you were talking, Laverne, about creating the world in which we want to see, um, and I hear the desire to be more involved in film and creating film and telling more stories. Um, I'm currently working on a project about the Screaming Queens, um, and it's actually going to be a narrative. So the Screaming Queens, for folks that don't know, uh, was a riot that happened in 1966 at the Jean, Jean Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. We don't hear about it three years prior to Stonewall because a lot of trans women of color were involved and there's not a lot of hype about it. So I'm creating a narrative and I want to know because there seems to be a desire there and I also want to create spaces for... for Are you networking? Queer people. <laughs> well, yes, yes. But queer people of color and queer trans folks of color, especially actors who are not tracked to be actors, um, I want to know how to get in touch with you to talk about this project because I do think that um, I'm writing with you in mind. So my agent is here somewhere. Okay. Oh, no. Um, uh, no, that, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. But there is a, I do want to say, there's a, you know, do you know the documentary Screaming Queens is on yes, Amazon? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, just, yes. great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alyssa Osorio, and I go to the City College of New York, and I was the director of the Guillermo Morales Asada Shakur Student and Community Center, which was a <laughs> radical safe space um, for a lot of queer working class people of color and we found a lot of solace there and it was taken away and like our organizing has been hit hard. We actually won our gender neutral bathroom campaign because of like Bird Dog and it was so long and like did know your rights trainings against the police, fought against tuition hikes and we're working on a gender resource center because we actually have a sexual predator, known sexual predator on our faculty and I wanted to know your thoughts on, since the space has been taken away, a lot of people who found solace there, a lot of gender non-conforming people, a lot of uh, queer people have like dropped out without our safe space. And I wanna know what is your kind of thoughts and opinions on community building physical spaces in relation to identity-based organizing? That's kind of complicated. The physical space is, is deeply important. I think in New York City, there's spaces that it says a premium. But I think we can create those spaces wherever we are. I, I, I think we can we can gather anywhere. And, 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 it, and it's a, sometimes it's not, we, we don't always have the space. I understand, I hear the, that it was a safe space for a lot of people and a lot of people dropped out, but I think we can create that safe space anywhere. If we have a group of folks who are a harmonious space. Um, anywhere um, with, with the right group of people um, and I the right values. I call it Mary McLeod Bethune model, where she started Beth Bethune Cookman College in her living room. Again, start where you are. Your question? Hello. This is on. Hi, hello, my name is Lada Nawad. I'm actually a student here at the New School. My question is directed at Bell. First of all, thank you so much both for coming. But um, you made a comment earlier about 
embracing kind of like wearing high heels and having long hair and kind of feeding into the patriarchal gaze. And I was wondering, is it not possible to do that as a personal choice, as something that is liberating for the woman that herself without necessarily coupling it with having to do with any type of male attention? Because what if there are some women who embrace that and find themselves liberated and powerful when they are feeling more comfortable with their image when they embrace these looks? I'm not sure if that made sense. But well, I, mean, I don't have a problem with that, but one thing I will say is like I'll have a lot of women say to me, well, how I wear my hair is just my personal choice. And then I think the question of whether we care for the solidarity of community. Because something I might do as my personal choice might actually be sending a message to someone else, someone younger, that um, I must be self-hating or I must not value, uh, especially the issue of hair in, in black life. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's a challenge. There have been times in my life where I have thought, well, I, like, I wouldn't mind straightening my hair. And then I've challenged myself around, you may have the self-confidence where that act is just a free will act, but what about the impact of that action on other people? And that's where, where I think we have to be discerning and, and again, be critically vigilant. Your question? My name is Aja, and I had a question for you, Laverne. Um, I, I have a lot of friends, or I've recently come to have friends who have gone through uh, their changes of, of trying to either become men or women and, um, and, and not be defined or be defined. And I had a question because it's particularly affected me in trying to talk about women who try to become men and that discussion of not, not being as popularized as we see men or women, men of color becoming women and some of the ways in which those women who become men or try to tra transition into that inflict or perpetuate some of the same um, issues that they critique before in patriarchy. Um, and that's a discussion I think doesn't often get talked about. Um, I wanted to know what are some of your critiques of the trans movement and where do you see it going um, in light of that? Well, what I am so moved by are, are the, what, what she's talking about are trans men, I think, who, who, um, who transition uh, female to male, who transition and then become these patriarchs and adapt, you know. But I, what I'm so moved by is how many trans men I know who um, have a feminist politic, who do not embrace traditional masculinity when they transition. And there's a lot of trans men out there like that. And then also sometimes that can be a phase. I think when, when people transition, early transition, sometimes we can go to extremes in terms of what we think we should be doing in terms of gender performance, and that could just be a phase. And so, um, if you don't if you don't feel safe with this person, then I think it's important to, to note that um, and to be lovingly critical if you can. But it could just be a phase, and just also know that there are a lot of folks, trans folks, trans men who are very critical of patriarchy who do not embrace traditional masculinity or defining masculinity on, on anti-patriarchal terms. Your question? Hi, my name's Mel. It's um, crazy to be seeing you guys here in person. Um, wow, and I really hope this isn't a stupid question. But um, Laverne, so in Orange and the New Black, your brother actually portrayed Sophia prior to transition, correct? And yes. I guess the way that I understand it was that you had actually wanted to act out those roles, uh, those scenes, but the staff kind of insisted on having a man play the role, so uh, you suggested your brother. Um, I guess I've always heard this kind of uh, portrayed in a positive light, but I've, I always kind of heard it as a story of like agency over role, where like you were speaking as a trans woman saying, I want to portray this character to the fullest extent, and yet they insisted on having a man play a trans woman anyways. I just wanted to know, was that a positive experience, or do you feel like it was a bit of agency over role? And not a read on your brother, he did a great job. You both are like really, really great. <laughs> My brother could care less about what you do. Um, how do I do this? A short answer. Um, Gingy said to me when we initially talked about the, who would play me, who would play the character pre-transition. She said she didn't want to re-traumatize me. That was the, literally the first thing she said to me. I'm like, I'm an actor. I can do it. I'll do anything. Um, and we did a hair and makeup test for like about eight hours. And I initially like, okay, let's try it. We did. I put me in like all this fake facial hair, and like I was trying to butch up. And once we did that, they didn't think that I looked masculine enough um, to do it, and they didn't want to. They didn't have time to do heavy prosthetics or anything like that. So they 
came to the decision to hire someone. So they gave me the chance to do it, but it was a really, it was an aesthetic decision. Hi, thank you for um, being here. My name is Lolan. Um, so I do a lot of community organizing um, uh, in the left um, uh, um, political social justice world here in New York, primarily with queer and trans people of color. Um, uh, there is such a, um, a high rate of burnout since we're always organizing in um, moments there's always crisis, um, urgency, there, you know, it's just, it's, and it's unrelenting. Um, can you share um, words that can help in sort of a building of a resilience practice for folks who are in the trenches on the daily um, for how to, how, to, how to keep in it in the, uh, for the long run? Because there's so many of us who are, you know, we get to, 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 to the 30s and, and, and we start to burn out and we leave from, for, you know, broken bodies or broken hearts. So anything you could share would be helpful. Thank you. This is for me too. <laughs> I. I think it's, I, I got to that point for, with myself earlier this year when I got, when I got an Emmy nomination, I said to myself, for this month while I'm nominated for this Emmy, I'm gonna be an actress. Yes. And I let a lot of stuff go. And I was basically, it was me taking a break. That's what it ended up being, taking a break from the, the, the very, very intense work of what it means to, to stand up against injustice is exhausting. So that was a lovely, I would say take breaks, whatever you can, and then also a big thing that I've been saying to myself is do, don't become codependent with the work. So that I stay, so that I stay separate. So that I figure a way to stay separate and not have my worthiness on the line in this work, that I stay separate. Thank you. Trying to be succinct. <laughs> So this question is for Ms. Cox. Um, in light of the Dallas Buyers Club, did Genji ever confide in you why she, as a member of the mainstream media influence, finally choose to cast a trans actor to portray and play a trans character? And could you possibly comment on cisgendered people playing trans folks in mainstream media? Work. <laughs> I think he really sort of answered the question with, with the question. Um, I I, you know, I, I, don't, I wasn't privy to the casting process of my show. I do understand that they were really interested in finding someone trans to play um, the role. There was a running joke in the writer's room. Ideally, we'd like to find a trans actor who can really act and who has an identical twin brother. <laughs> and, and sometimes you just have to ask the universe. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, they, were, they were committed to that, and I, I, I auditioned, and lots of trans folks auditioned, and I got the part. I think as an actor, I want to have a, an opportunity to play a wide range of roles, so I would never say that um, cis, cis actors shouldn't play trans. Um, I just, trans folks need jobs, and... Um, Excellent answer. And I think that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. Um, I just, um, as a writer, I find it difficult to navigate um, the politics of creating new representations without erasing the society that we're living in, the white supremacist patriarchal society. Because on the one hand, I feel like, as you mentioned last year, I think you were talking about how I'm so tired of seeing young black girls always being the victim in movies and, and all these things. So I want to create positive representations that don't necessarily have to be around tragedy all the time. But at the same time, I want to remain realistic and not fall into this new colorblind, forward okay, society. OK, question in this. I'm wondering how can I navigate, or, or if you have any advice on how to navigate between the two worlds of uh, like trying to represent, but at the same time not erasing well, I think that you, it's not an either or world. That you may want to write something or you deal with, I want to be more real in this, and then I want to write something that's more imaginary, abstract. Um, and I think we have to give ourselves permission to have an expansive imagination and to do different kinds of things. Your question? Yeah. 
Um, thank you both for being here today. My question was directed at you, Laverne. Um, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about more about this um, idea of sustaining visibility and leadership. So um, I don't know if you're aware, but yesterday, Cece McDonald started a fundraiser, um, a GoFundMe account to, to fund her life, right, because she's dealing with tough economic issues. So you did talk a lot today about what's going on with you and Janet and, and women who were successful and really visible. But I wanted to know if you can talk more about what it's like to sustain the leadership of women who are not necessarily you know, that economically enfranchised. How can we support these women and keep them as our leaders? Work. This is, this is, this is very tough. And, I, and with, with Cece, we, gosh, I, I love Cece so much. And she's so amazing. But, but the deep thing is that Cece has a felony conviction. And she is a black trans woman. And so the whole thing of sustaining herself um, post that is, is, has been a challenge. And we've been doing what we, what we can. Um, it's, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer. You know, for me, I've gotten, you know, I've sort of, I'm just new to like, you know, not being, you know, barely paying my rent. Like this is a new thing for me when the first of the month comes and I have the rent. Um, <laughs> this is a very new thing. So it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I know. I don't know if I know. I do know that I, I love CC and, um, We've been doing everything we can. We're work, making a documentary with Cece. We've been doing everything we can um, to make sure that she is she is paid for her time when she works with us. Um, we've um, we had an Indiegogo campaign, and 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 so Cece's got some of that money from from the campaign to sustain herself and for her time. Um, so we're doing what we can, um, but you're it's hard. You're avoiding eye contact. I'm sorry. I was saying you're avoiding eye contact. No, I was I was making eye contact with with the person I was talking to. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's it's a hard it's a hard answer. Um, it's a hard answer, but but I wasn't aware of the campaign, so I'm going to talk to CC. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. Laverne, I adore you, and my question is for Ms. Hooks over here. Uh, you were talking about money earlier, and you talk a lot about the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, right? Uh, I work at a nonprofit. I know a lot of people here work at nonprofits. And even if you do, it's capitalism that's funding you, right? There was a climate march last week that was sponsored by Lockheed Martin. Uh, a lot of non, like nonprofit human rights work is funded by uh, corporations who have less than ideal practices. And I'm wondering for you how you will how you navigate aligning your values with your work um, when like finding money, it's, it's impossible to find if not in those spaces that precisely that we're trying to break down and to work against. I, th I think that we live in the space of contradictions. There's no one in this room who lives in this country that isn't living within capitalism and in some way making use of capitalism in our lives. And so the question again is one of making the decision of how far do you want to go into something. You know, uh, for 40 years, I was with an independent press, South End Press. Uh, they've gone under. Um, and now I sold those books to a more corporate press, which is Rutledge. Um, and I made that choice because I want the books to stay in print and to come into print again very quickly. So that all of those decisions, again, are individual decisions that we constantly battle with and have to make. Um, and I, I think one thing I do feel strongly is we have to create lifestyles that are commiserate with the incomes that we have. Because people have a lot of suffering because they may choose, like, I'll work with this nonprofit, I won't make much money, but then want to continue the lifestyle that they may have had when they had more money. And so there's a lot of suffering. Your question? Hi, my name is Kazimbe. We actually met years ago at the Breck Forum. Yes, my darling. Hi, how are you doing? Um, thank you, and I really appreciate this conversation. I work primarily in history. Um, I'm a, you know independent scholar, and I do a lot of work. But my question is, how do you see this moment in terms of transgendered history fitting into the way we look at history backwards? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just wondering, like, how do you see um, the scholarship being developed? And, and who really inspires you now in terms of the work that's going on in terms of really trying to p put in transgendered history into black history so we're going to have a fuller idea of history? Well, well that's uh, Monica Roberts, who has this brilliant blog called, we know Monica? She has this brilliant blog called the uh, Trans Griot, and she's been doing that work for years, recovering black trans history, and, and it's really wonderful. It's hard for me to sort of um, quantify this moment because I'm, I'm, I'm so deeply entrenched in it, but there's, 
fo folks um, like Monica um, are doing the work, and I think it's this really important that folks in the academy are no longer talking about trans folks, that trans folks are having a voice in that. I think that is, that is the piece that we're starting to see more of, so that we're not objectified and sensationalized and sort of othered in the academy in this sort of fascinating way, that we have um, real trans people um, at the table um, writing this history. Thank you. We have one last question, and before that question is asked, we, we thank again Stephanie Browner, Heather, Jennifer, all the helpers, and the new school. Your name? Um, hi, thank you guys so much for coming. Y'all are wonderful. Um, this question is for you, Bell Hooks. How do you personally keep yourself safe um, as a black face in a predominantly white space, especially being a queer black face in a predominantly white heteronormative space? Well, I mean, I am a believer in therapy. I'm a serious <laughs> believer in, um, in therapy, and I think therapy comes in many forms. The therapeutic conversation we might have with a friend, the actual going to a therapist. I was just, I just had, um, uh, a breakfast to welcome Crystal, a writer, black woman writer, Crystal Wilkinson, joining us in Berea. And we went around and we talked about what helps us sustain ourselves. And I said, you know, that for t 10 years, I get together once a week with one of my black women colleagues there um, so that we can process together and support one another. And so I think all of those things are part of what helps us survive in alien spaces and in hostile spaces. We have obviously not been in a hostile space tonight. We appreciate your patience, your harmony. I just can't believe Lamar didn't ask a question. <laughs> but I guess it's because he knows everything there is to know about Laverne Cox and Bell Hooks. 